So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. We will actually be focusing on uh, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, those three chapters. And, and ultimately, that section of Scripture is what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. And maybe you've read that before, or you've heard that before, but didn't know the full context of it. This is a sermon in which a large crowd gathers together, and Jesus uh, gathers, you know, they, they're, they're on the side of a mountain, and Jesus begins speaking to them. And he just lays out this powerful, powerful talk. And honestly, I believe that if we were to take, if you had to pick a section of Scripture, like, okay, you get three chapters out of the Bible, we're gonna, you're going to tear those out, and that's all you get from the Bible. This is probably one of the most important sections that will, that will teach and lead us in regards to how to live the Christian life. Now, how many of you in this room would say, honestly, uh, when it comes to, do I want God's blessing or do I want to live without God's blessing? I don't care about God's blessing. It's irrelevant in my life. How many of you would say, I want God's blessing on my family, on my home, on the things that I do? You want His involvement. <clears throat> my prayer as a pastor, my prayer as a, as a person that's pursuing Jesus, is that everybody would want that. Because the alternative stinks to be outside of God's blessing. Now, you understand, to be in His blessing, there's certain things that He says, that if we do these things, you're blessed. Now, are His blessings, is your salvation, is your position in Jesus, uh, does that determine whether you're, you're, you're blessed or not? You're saved by grace, right? Through faith in Him. Blessing is an additional thing on that, right? I can be saved, but I can be operating my money outside of His blessing. I can be saved, but I can be leading my family in a way that isn't really operating in His blessing. question is, do you want to go from just being saved to experiencing the fullness of who God is? And the full power of living out the Christian life. Do you want that for your life? Or do you want to just kind of struggle? You know, I, I, get, I get an opportunity to sit down with a lot of couples. And couples that are uh, doing great in their marriage. And couples that are literally, and I've had this, people sitting in, in, in the chairs in front of my desk. Pastor, we were on our way to sign divorce papers. We called you. Because this is a last-ditch effort. And to have those conversations breaks my heart. Because we begin unpacking those things. And a lot of it boils down to the foundation of that home. What is that home built on? And we read this in this, in this passage out of Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 24. Uh, and I'll read this out of the NIV, which we have on the screen up there. Um, it says, therefore, and anytime you see that word, what are you supposed to ask yourself? What's it there for? Exactly. Uh, so that's an important word we'll come back to. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it's found, it had its foundation on the rock. In fact, I would even say this. I found this interesting. I didn't mention this first service, but we were building the, uh, the coat racks that we have out here. If you didn't know, we have some coat racks right on the other side of that wall. And as we're making those things, we built these things solid. We built them out of oak. In fact, they're all actually made out of four of our old church pews. So if you see those, those are our, our pews that have been made into coat racks. And, and uh, so they're, they're solid. And then when we, when we were screwing the hooks onto them, something happened that kind of I, I thought was funny. Maybe it's simple, but I thought it was funny. When the drill hit bottom and that screw was all the way in, that, that hook, that metal hook, was so fastened to that oak that it began to actually resonate. You could actually tap those metal hooks and they would almost sing. It was kind of weird. <clears throat> and the reason I say that is because 
When, when you are fastened to something that's solid, something happens that goes beyond just setting on there, but it begins to resonate through your being. Are you following with me this morning? That it goes beyond just being put on a rock, but when you're attached, there's something where that rock infuses and begins to translate through you. And Jesus, when he's your rock, does more than just Oh, cool, I've got this Jesus under me. He begins to resonate through you, and you, your, your, your being is almost harmonious with him. Does that make any sense? Kind of a weird illustration in regards to coat racks. Uh, I guess they've been memorialized in that way. But it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But verse 26, But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. Sand is often synonymous with beaches, or farming in Minnesota, but um, usually beaches, right? Uh, Many people around the area, they like building houses as close to the water as you can possibly get, right? Uh, And you see those, even Southern California houses, big condominium places that are right next. You almost wonder, like, if the, if the water rose a foot, wouldn't that fill their basements, right? So close to the water's edge. And, and, I, and I was even thinking about this and praying about this. And, and how much is it, like, this concept of building our house on the sand, we're literally building as close to temptation and struggle as we possibly can. How much can I toe the line of, of the shifting sands? And get away with it. And you can do it for a while, can't you? And then something comes along. And the storms come. And it says here, uh, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down. The streams rose. The winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a what? With a great crash. Okay, you can, you know, did the houses, does it say the houses are different? The thing that was different about them was what they were established on. Oftentimes, you look around and sometimes it's hard to tell who's built their house on on, on Jesus, the solid foundation, and who's just built their house on shifting sand. You'll find out when the storms come. And unfortunately, those storms, this concept that no man's an island, those storms don't just affect you. And men, I'm especially speaking to you this morning. God has called you to be the spiritual heads of your home. And when you fail at that, when you fail to listen to and heed the wisdom of God's word, it doesn't just affect you. It affects your family. It affects so many people around you. And oftentimes, women, wives are very good at picking up that mantle. They're running with it. But God has called you to lead to lead well. The rain, the rain come up, the streams rose, or came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house. Man, that would instill a lot of fear. You know how many couples I've sat down with that were absolutely afraid because of what they were going through? There was no healthy communication. There was no healthy conflict resolution. There were they, you know, dis, complete discord in how they're handling money and, and just selfish even. Well, I want to do what I want to do. I'm a guy, and I want to do what I want to do. And I want you to understand something, okay? When you get married, it's no longer about me. It's about we. Amen? And if you're, you're trying to, well, I still want to hold the me. There is no me in we. You, you give up yourself. The two become one. And it's no longer about your selfish desires. But how can we work as a team to accomplish a goal, to accomplish a mission that God has set before us. And if you're constantly worried about the shaking and shifting sand, you're not going to be able to achieve anything. You're just trying to hold your house together. Amen? So I pray that you hear God's word and you do it. So, but what is it to have a foundation that is established on Jesus? What is this rock that we hear about in this, in this passage. Now, 
Does strength come to you accidentally? Did anybody in here suddenly wake up and you're like, dude, where'd that come from? Right? No, it doesn't, right? Unless you, unless you don't realize that you're throwing 300 hay bales, right? Like, that, they'll, they'll show up then after a couple days of aching pain, right? It's kind of like Bubba going to the gym. <laughs> anybody, anybody ever gone to the gym? Just be honest. You, I don't need to, I'm not saying you did anything there. You went there. Maybe even you drove by one in the new year, right? Yeah, you know, in 2015, my goal was to, to weigh 180 pounds. In 2016, my goal is to weigh 200 pounds. In 2018, my goal is to drive by the gym, right? Maybe that's all you got. But you ever seen a Bubba in a gym who, who does more of this and less of this? Oh, you know what I'm, if you've ever been in a gym, you've seen those guys sitting there all cool and posed, yeah, scrolling on their phone. Like, dude, that's not exercise, right? I mean, you've got to give them kudos because they at least went. But if you're not going to bother getting on the equipment, why are you there? You know, are you there to look at the girls on the treadmill? You creeper, right? If you're going to go... Get on the treadmill. Is it going to hurt? Yes. If it doesn't hurt, you're doing it wrong. Just saying, right? Getting stronger in your life is rarely pleasant, but it's always worth it. Amen? Examining your foundation and looking at things in your marriage and your parenting and your personal spiritual life is important but rarely fun, if you want to say it that way. Because we all have junk in our lives, don't we? We've all got a little fat around the tummy here, right? A little spare tire. Uh, some of, maybe some of you. I probably just insulted someone because you're like, no, I don't. Uh, girls, I'm not saying, um, okay, then I'm talking to you. I'm talking to the guys. Guys, we all got a little something around there, don't we? That we need to work on, especially if you've been married. I couldn't gain weight until I got married. <laughs> And then I gained way more than I wanted. But how many times do you see somebody that goes to the gym and not actually doing what they're there for? And it's kind of like coming to church. I've seen this so many times. I've been a pastor for oh, this church for almost eight years, believe it or not. It's crazy. Uh, I've been a pastor for over 12 years. And it's, cra it's crazy to see and it puzzles me the number of people that will come to church on a very, very regular basis. And they'll hear the Word of God. And they'll, they'll experience things in church. But they'll do nothing with it in their life. And they'll, they'll, they'll make decisions even. Yeah, I'll do that. And then we don't. And it's kind of like Bubba going to, the, going to the gym. You're there, but... It's not benefiting you anything until you get on the machine, until you get in and you actually apply it to your life. Are you tracking with me this morning? My prayer is that when you come to church, you encourage one another. You speak life into one another. And when you build friendships with each other, then you can say, hey, come on. I know you know better. And then you're going you're gonna to spur one another on towards what? Towards righteousness. Towards right living. So what are some of the things that we should be desiring in our personal life? If you want to make your marriage better, you focus on you. If you want to make your parenting better, like Dr. Kevin Lehman says, have a new kid by Friday, right? Have a new spouse by Friday. Anybody ever gone through those, right? They're worth it, okay? The main point of them, if you want better kids, you work on some stuff in you. If you want a better spouse, you work on some stuff in you. We have better families by focusing on ourselves getting stronger, ourselves getting better. So, in this series that we're doing, Family Matters, we're going to dig into some of the practical things that we can do as Christians to make our homes a stronger place. Practical things we can do as Christians to invite God's blessing on our home. Things that we can add 
and things that we can remove that align us better with what his plan is. You realize God has a plan for your life. Raise your hand if you think God has a plan for your life. Okay, there's some of you that haven't figured that out yet, okay? <laughs> God absolutely does. And he's leading us and he's directing in those, some, of those, some of those things. But what are you building your life on? If you were to examine your foundation, what are you building it on? And if you were to define some of those things, when you think about how you interact with your spouse, are you overbearing or are you kind and considerate? Are you patient or do you have fits of rage? And when you recognize those things, do you say, oh, man, I feel bad about that. I want to work on that. Or you just say, oh, that's just me. Get over it. Deal with it, woman. And it might sound harsh, but you know how many times I've heard guys say that? It's just who I am. She needs to deal with it. I want to smack you. Honestly. And I won't feel bad about that. But there's certain things. Have you ever experienced the conviction of God on your life for something you've done? I hope you have. I hope you have. But one of the things to understand, and I actually made this as my screensaver on my phone, God will never convict you unless he, uh, of something unless you... And, I can't read it through this thing. God will never convict you unless he fully intends to empower you. So if he brings something to your attention, it's because he wants to work on it, but he's going to give you the strength to overcome it. But oftentimes, we're just fine with going by with status quo. We're just fine with going along with the culture, whatever the culture says. You know, shifting with the culture is a scary place to be. It's, it's, it's always changing. Just follow the news. You know, now what was it? The, the newest thing, uh, big outrage was uh, the New Year's uh, TV host person who was lighting up a bong and celebrating the smoking of pot on live national, even worldwide TV. Another article was coming out about uh, how Silicon Valley and the big um, drug and money and sex-driven parties that they're having and, and the hookup culture... And actually, the pushback that's happening against some of that, because what used to be unspoken, what used to be abhorred, culturally is becoming more and more embraced. And that's scary. And this is what I love about God's Word. It transcends time when it comes to being able to define what's right and what's wrong. Do you believe there are certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong? Do you truly believe that? Because if you truly believe it, it'll affect your behavior. And there are, there are times in which God will allow storms to come by in your life to reveal what your foundation is. And if it's all been sand, it'll wash away pretty quick, won't it? What's the content of your foundation? I'm going to read that th this passage out of, out of Matthew chapter 7 is actually the end of Jesus' sermon. That therefore is there because he's like, all these things I've spoken over three chapters. If you do it, you're wise. If you don't, you're foolish. I want to be wise. So you back up, and I think the way he starts his sermon is no accident. You back up to chapter 5, verse 2. He began speaking, and he taught them, saying... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I don't think he said that by accident. You've heard, you're familiar with the Beatitudes? Right? In the Beatitudes, he lays out these characteristics of our mindset in humility towards God, in submission to God, even in recognizing that God is a little bit more powerful than you and I, isn't he? A lot bit more powerful. And blessed are the poor in spirit. Basically, blessed are those that are wise enough to recognize that you have a spiritual need that can only be filled by God. Have you come to that point in your life yet? And then he goes on and he talks about some characteristics. Blessed are those that mourn for they'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. 
What's one of the number one things that you hear about people that are pursuing the ways of this world? After they've done them, they feel empty. You ever heard that? I tried this, I tried this, just nothing ever satisfied. You know, I do this a little bit of drug, and then when it wore off, I had to do this much, and then I do this much, and then this much, and it just never satisfies. And yet when you pursue hunger and thirst for righteousness, you'll be filled. Blessed are the merciful, where they will obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Are you pursuing purity in your home? If I, if, if, if I were to ask you what you, if you give me access to your Netflix or your voodoo or whatever you watch or your movie collection, would you be embarrassed to watch some of those movies with Jesus? Be like, oh, that's an awkward one. <laughs> right? Do you filter those things? You keep your marriage bed pure and help protect your kids from some of the filth that's out there. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who basically, when you do all this stuff, and the world persecutes you for it, uh, you still press on, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What are the elements? Actually, we, we mentioned this in first service. What are the elements that you are using to build your foundation? And uh, if any, any, any concrete workers in here? Anybody that's ever worked with concrete, plaster of Paris, we'll go for that. Any, anybody ever made a pinata, okay? <laughs> Maybe that's a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> concrete is a pretty neat animal. And the elements in themselves don't seem like much, do they? But when you add a little bit of water, or in, in the case of what, where Jesus is talking in this parable, you add a little bit of a storm or a trial, and if I were to scoop a bit of this and I put it in a bucket, right? Or I dump that into a five-gallon pail. And I pour it in a little bit of water. I don't even have too much stir. You wait the next day, that's a hard block, isn't it? Those elements, when the right elements are included, and we're willing to press in and we're willing to discover what those important elements are, and we build with those, and we add the elements of, of the trials and the struggles that Jesus brings into our lives to shape us and grow us, we become strong and well-rooted. But oftentimes, instead, we focus on what's fun. How can I be entertained? Life's all about me. I want to be cool, right? So maybe you know where this is going. Instead of using concrete, you got a little bit of Kool-Aid, right? You add a little bit of water to that. Is it good? Oh, it's good for a while. But can I build a foundation on that? No. No, and I would even say when we desire the things of this world, and I'm not saying Kool-Aid's evil, because I love Kool-Aid, okay? But when the focus is on just my entertainment, my pleasure, there's no character building in that. Character is built through trial and the refining process that Jesus brings us through. So I love this this sermon that Jesus gives us. In fact, my challenge to every one of you is over the course of this week to read Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Read through that. In fact, I'd encourage you to read it every day. It's three chapters. Read it every day. And watch what God does in your heart. He spells out things like, you ever heard anybody say, no one can judge me? He addresses that in there. And you heard the Lord's Prayer? Got any bitterness towards anyone? Got any anger towards anyone? Ever lusted before? Jesus addressed all those things in this sermon. It's a powerful, powerful sermon. But as a family, my desire is that we are not just a Christian family. We are a family whose foundation is on Christ, and everything we do is built upon Him. You see the difference in that? Okay, we don't just go to church, we are the church. We don't just uh, tag on a couple, oh, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have this little trait on me. Well, I become that. I allow it to consume me. Just because you call yourself a Christian doesn't make you one. Just because you call yourself a duck. Although I think nowadays you have to call somebody. If they want to be called a cat or a dog or a duck, do you have to do that? <laughs> Once again, shifting sands. Pretty sure I'm a guy, right? Not changing. 
no idea why I said that. Um, Jesus is not just part of our lives. He's the foundation of our hope, of our home. I love Psalm 63.1. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. And dry and parched place where there is no water. So how do you do that? How do we involve God? And one, I'd encourage you, if you're not getting into God's word, get into a habit of reading his word. Allow it to wash over you. I love listening to the, the Bible app. And just as I'm driving, I'll listen through the Old Testament. And it's just like, man, I didn't realize that about that story. That's so cool. You get the bigger picture of those. Get into God's word. Spend time praying over your family. In fact, Spend time praying with your family. And just to push back on that a little bit, I would ask you, when's the last time you prayed with your family? If it's been more than a couple of days, then it's not an important habit. And for some, that's kind of an ouch, isn't it? Begin to establish those patterns. Involve God in your daily conversations. It was fun. Six o'clock this morning at the gas station in Wadena, having a fun conversation about church and, and some, other, some other pastors in, in other cities and, and some, you know, the guy was like, dude, I saw this pastor, he's got, he's the only pastor I know who's working on two full sleeves. And he was like totally impressed with that and we started this whole fun conversation, six o'clock in the morning today. Involve God in your conversations and watch how he uses them. I didn't challenge you in this too. Make going to church a habit of humility and a non-negotiable. Our family, we go to church, period. If we're on vacation, we will find a church. And it's fun to check them out. It's fun to go to those places. Because, like I said before, when you come to church, do you expect God to do something? Do you expect them to do something in your life? Every time you come to church, you should be expecting, God's going to speak something to me. Because if you don't expect it, he won't do it. Promise you that. Sometimes you'll break through. Third is show how seeking God is important. Show that to your kids. If you don't make it a priority, they won't. Oftentimes I've had parents ask me, why is it my kid's behaving like this? Many times we can point back to the parent. Amen? None of the parents like to hear that, do they? Kids oftentimes are very good at copying their role models. Involve God in every area of your family. You can do a whole lot of sharing your faith. You can do a whole lot of um, being bold in your testimony just by living your life in a way that honors God. But are you going to do the things that he says or just like, oh, that's a neat concept. I challenge you. If you have, if there's things in your life, I, God, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to work on that. That you, you make this year, 2018, a year where you stop pushing against God and invite him to bless your home. Invite him to bless your life. Joshua 24, 15. Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will What? We will serve the Lord. I can't trust society. The culture shifts around so much. The awesome thing about God's word is it crosses cultural boundaries. It crosses time. It is steadfast. And when I apply those things that God says in his word, my marriage is better, my parenting is better, my thought life is better, my finances are better, and I'm not just saying they're easy, but they're better. And there is a difference. Does that make sense this morning, church? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the challenges that you bring our way. But Lord, we thank you that as we can get into your word, like Matthew 5 through 7, you lay out so many truths that we can apply to our lives and Father, I pray that you would help us with that. In fact, church, this morning, 
If you're here and, and you know that there's something in your life that God wants to work on, He's like, I want to bless you in this, but you need to let me work in there. You need to let me do a little bit of chiseling on your life. If you know that there's something that God wants to work on you in this year ahead, would you be willing to let him do that, even if it hurts a little bit, knowing that his blessing is worth it? In fact, I'd call you to action on that. Would you raise your hand and say, yes, pastor, that's me. I, I, there's some God, things that God is working on me I haven't been doing very good at, but I trust that he's going to give me the strength. Would you, would you just lift your hand up? There's hands up all over this room. In fact, would you be so bold? We had water baptism last week, which is a public testimony, like I am going to live my life to honor God. Would you, would you stand up this morning and say, yes, that's me. I will, uh, I will work on that foundation. I will focus on making Jesus the foundation of my life. All over this room, people are saying, yes, that's me. And if, if you're not at that point in your life, Maybe you're not there yet. Maybe you don't have Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior yet. Why wait any longer? He loves you. It's his kindness that causes us to come to repentance. But everything we're talking about today is because God adores you. You hear that this morning? He adores you. He sacrificed everything to have a relationship with you. He has a plan as the mastermind creator to put purpose in your life. Man, what an exciting thing that is. Heavenly Father, as we stand before you today, Lord, I pray that as you are calling us to conviction on these things, Lord, that you would help us to do them. Help us to be wise builders today. Father, if there's any men in this room that are, that are struggling in how they treat their wives, Lord, that they would begin to speak life into this beautiful bride you've given them. Lord, any parents that are just short-fused with their kids or just struggling to even love their kids, Lord, that you begin to turn that around that they would be model parents in, in raising through a demonstration of a life. Father, if there's habits or drugs or addictions that are going on in their life, Lord, that you begin to break those things, that this would be the best year ever. Father, we love you. We trust in you today. If everyone would stand with me right now, And one of the things I want you to understand, if you didn't stand, that's okay. Everybody's at a different spot in their journey. But God is doing something in the hearts of his people this morning. And I pray that you are willing to give him room and trust him over this next year. So my challenge to you this week is to get into God's Word, especially those three chapters. And if that means your entire devotional time this week is focused on those three chapters, pray it over. Like we mentioned first service, Psalms talks about how we, a, a cow chews its cud and how literally with Scripture we can take that and we can process it over and over and develop that within our, within our spirit. Allow his word to transform your spirit. We do that this week? Awesome. With that, I uh, pray a blessing over you. I bless you and have a wonderful day.